Good morning. You don't need to do anything. Oh, no, where to get that off my screen. <laughs> uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the known world. Uh, welcome to another exciting episode of The Crown Between Two Roses. Um, I'm here with my co-host, Countess Beatrice, who will start off with our acknowledgements. Thank you. Uh, good nobles, we come here together in the spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing of our knowledge, and a shared interest in the search to find truth through experimental archaeology and historical inquiry. It is in this context that I, Countess Beatrice, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather. We recognise their continuing connection to land and culture, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and elders from other communities who may be here today. Thank you so much. And tonight we're very excited to have Sir Agro and Mistress Glenova from the Barony of Riverhaven joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, indeed. Thank you and good to chat. I think, I think most people across the kingdom probably have an idea of who you both are. Um, but could you start off telling us a little bit about how you came to find the SCA and then give that insight to just how um, how strong your history is with this kingdom. So who'd like to start? Lineva has to start because she got in a year before I did. All right, let's hear it. Okay, so there was a science fiction convention in Sydney, in North Shore, at the Atarman Hotel. And on the, it was over the Easter weekend, on the Monday morning, there was a group of strangely dressed people doing a little better. That was our introduction to the SCA. There was quite a group of us down from Brisbane. In those days, of course, it was the overnight bus. Quite, quite an adventure. So we saw Christia Barrett, uh, Rowan Peregrine, Olivia. A daughter, a group of young men, and it was quite entrancing. So we brought the idea home, said, well, we're running a convention at the end of the year, but this is a really good idea. How about we start thinking about this? Bruce and Nita Kerr opened their house. They were the hosts of the Doctor Who Society here in Brisbane. And we started having casual meetings, collecting various people who might be interested in the idea of the SCA in Queensland. Oh. So we had a number of meetings and a science fiction convention in September, having been thoroughly distracted for months, making medieval clothing and reading paperwork. One of the most influential people for me is Christia Barrett. I visited Sydney and she opened her filing cabinet. Back in those days, all of the resources we had access to were on paper and she was quite amazing. Being able to give me copies of leaflets about tea tunics and our very first copy of Queen Carol's Guide. And then she showed us an absolutely amazing treasure trove. She showed us our first known world handbook, which we promptly wrote a letter overseas and purchased one. Because back then, no internet. Everything was either telephone or snail mail. And this was a wonderful new world. That's very exciting. It was 1983. Oh, wow. I remember. Not now. So yeah, you were definitely one of the founding members of the SCA in Queensland. Uh, myself, Nita, and a couple of the other ladies were actually on that bus trip. And when we brought home the idea, Andrea Charlton at the university introduced us to the early music group. And some of their people were quite enthusiastic for a few years. And the rest were garnered from Star Trek, Doctor Who, Blake Seven, a whole range of other science fiction groups up here. And that's one of the reasons why our group became administratively active very, very quickly. 
we had experience in catering, running non-profit groups, registering with the government, doing all of our paperwork, volunteering as officers, running newsletters, printing newsletters, all of those things, all of those skills and experiences, we just transferred over to the SCA and we ran with it. I believe that's one of the reasons why we became a barony so quickly. Certainly helps. <laughs> There's a lot of paperwork involved, <laughs> a lot of a lot of organising and herding cats involved. So, indeed. So, how about you, Agra? How did you find out about the SCA from there? Right. Well, it's a short. Make the story short. I was in university at the time. I started playing chess with one of the fellows in my college, and after a month of that, he said, "I've got this interesting game that I think you're going to like." And the game was Dungeons and Dragons. And he described it to me. And I thought, that sounds totally ridiculous. I, you know, what is this guy on? And, of course, after my first game, I was hooked on that. Um, loved it with a passion. Still playing it. Yeah, still playing it. A few months later, we were playing a similar game called... Oh, typical Zoom meeting, got a cat on my lap. Um, we're playing a similar game called RuneQuest. And in the front uh, prefix of that, they were talking about um, these rules are approved by a group called the Society for Creative Anachronism. We fight with these kind of weapons all the time. And we all thought, those guys sound crazy because that's a great way to lose fingers and, you know, eyes and who knows what. And... About a month after that, we were in our standard D&D &D shop buying whatever, dice, books, something. And there was a leaflet in the window that had a fellow in armour, so you couldn't see his face with a caption that says, why is this man smiling? And he's smiling because he does medieval studies, pageantry, heraldry, tournament combat, whatever. And he's in a group called the Society for Creative Anachronism. And we said... We're going to have to go and see these guys because we know they're crazy, but let's check it out. So we turned up at a first fighter practice, and again, I was hooked from day one. Here so are. Bruce and Nita's house was the um, hosting point for the SCA in those days, and this carload of young gentlemen turned up wearing karate geese, and it was like, wow. It's like karate geese, period. They go back to wherever. That was our thought. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, so was that was it. After that, hooked. And that was, was in 1984 for sure. So now we're 37 years on from there. And we just attended our first Romani Festival and we had the photographs developed. So we were showing the photographs and these boys turned up and had a look at it and said, we want to join. So is that, I guess that's where you guys met then? Would have been in those early yeah, days? We met then. We, um, yes, we met then. Um, but it was a number of years later. That we became a couple, but it was probably a match made in heaven. I had a big car. She had a lot of gear. So travelling to and from events, we spent a lot of time together talking, bonding. Um, Where I tell it quite differently. You know, say, <laughs> oh, go on. Please do. He had a Commodore 64 and I had a colour portable TV. <laughs> and this was super important because she was doing the newsletters and with a Commodore 64, we could actually... Um, I could actually type in a page of the newsletter I bought a printer that hooked up to the Commodore 64. I could print it out, spot the mistakes, and go in and change it without having to retype the whole page. Amazing. It was joyful. <laughs> Remember, this was the mid 80s, and you know, computers really weren't a thing. <laughs> mm, absolutely. So I was, was going to ask if it was. Um, 
was it Glenavar that got you hooked or was it the fighting that, that got you hooked on that? Oh, well, he was fighting well before we hooked up. It was definitely a fighting. <laughs> and, of course, he was very good very early because he was so enthusiastic. He actually built a full, well, what we thought was a legal set of armour at the time. And he would practice in Bruce and Nita's backyard where we had three or four other people who had pieces but not a complete set. So one of them would dress fully, fight aggro, and then aggro would take a break while that fighter took off all of his gear and the next fighter selected the pieces he needed to kit up. And I'd be inside upstairs with ice packs and liniment and such like. You know, we'd watch the boys over the balcony and as one of them came off the field, it would be a matter of, you know, where did you get hit? Did you have some putt foam there? Is there a bruise? Forearm strains? Quite a few interesting things in those days. So, yeah, I had the first suit of armour in our well, Shire then. And as she says, there were three or five people who had like one piece each. So, yes, yeah, so I got three or, five, three or four times as much fighting as everybody else. Mm-hmm. It was a help. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, that's very cool. Do you have any of that original set? Um, he has a little bit. Yeah. Because for our 30th baronial, um, the Queen, we actually had some pieces on display of a whole, you know, different generations of armour from throughout the decades. And the Queen asked him whether or not his turtle shells were all fitted. It almost fitted. I wore it for the tournament. We had a look at it and said, it covers most of your kidneys. That's enough. <laughs> the straps didn't do up, but that's about it. Tapes for. Um, actually, of that first suit of armour, I've still got my chain mail, which was made out of 7,000, say, 25, 30 mil key rings. Um, that, that was part of my first suit of armour. And the oldest piece of armour that I used to still wear was my forearm armour, which I made at a very early war, probably in my first year of fighting. And I thought that was the oldest piece of armour still in use in Lockac, but one of Raymond's helmets is still in use, so he's got me beaten on that. Oh, his sorry. sons is wearing one of his old helmets. <laughs> oh, wow. From before the SCA in Australia. So and I can't really compete legal? with that. From the Kingdom of Outremer. <laughs> and and the, the helmet. Kingdom were... of Cumberland. That was it, Cumberland. I'm surprised that it lasted that long and it is still, like, protective. <laughs> That's, that's, well a, that's a well-made piece of armour. <laughs> it's true. I've worn out a couple of helmets. Maybe you could sit less often than I do. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So the, we've, we've spoken about fighting. What, about, what other interests do you have? I guess that's directed at me because Glenavar really watches the fighting. She has... Our first Penzic War, I, I got her authorised heavy so she could fight in the Penzic War. I'm um, traditionally a combat archer. And we, we chatted to Gregory and said, you know, how many, ar- how many battles will have archery in it? And he said, uh, four. And I said, well, in a two-week-long war, that doesn't sound like enough. Would you like to fight heavy? So she did. But the question was to me, what I like besides fighting? Um, archery, obviously. Um, singing, telling stories, uh, you know, feasting. I quite enjoy the food, camaraderie, uh, singing. Well, I said singing. I guess I like, there's nothing that I don't. I guess when I need something, I just do it. Um, we have a couple of wooden chairs that we just needed a wooden chair, so I made them. Um, um listening box, sure, that's lasted for. I made that I don't know, 25, 30 years ago and thought I can do a much better job, but it never wore out. So I never, but we're still using it. Every time I look at it, I say, I really should remake that, but it hasn't broken yet. So I'm not going to fix it. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, traveling, collecting life experiences, learning. 
He's not done very much over the years in the calligraphy illumination area. True, not good at that. He has <laughs> actually picked up a needle and then promptly gave it back to me. <laughs> he does sew leather, but he doesn't sew fabric. Really, she's so much better than me with the fabric. There's no incentive. She's an expert, a genius. Absolutely. How about how about you, Gunnar? What are some of your interests? Having come in through the science fiction area, yes, I was already into admin being a public servant and I knew my way around the paperwork, but I'd been making costumes for 10 years by that stage. And historical costumes are a lot easier because technically we only have one head, two arms, two legs, which is not true in science fiction costuming every time. <laughs> And of course, the majority of the series that we were looking at, like Star Trek, usually had at least one episode, and of course, Doctor Who had many beautiful stories set in historical settings. So whether or not it be Italian or um, Dark Ages, we'd already tried that kind of costuming and moving into the SCA and developing you know, skills along the lines of cutting 15 tea tunics over a weekend was really just one extra step. Mm. So I've stayed with the fibre arts, mostly dressmaking, nail binding, embroidery. I do enjoy the archery. As I said, predominantly my fighting has been combat archery. I really only slowed down on that after having a hip operation. But that was my first 20 years going out and shooting people. Oh, Spring War was a joy. <laughs> Lots of fun. The doctor says she can do anything she likes except fall over. So that's limited things a little bit. It's got to be a small scenario where I've got something like a couple of trees or a nice set of hay bales. And if someone gets too close, I just die. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Can't run around anymore. Yeah. I remember being chased down by Draco in one of his first wars and thought, oh, that's a greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> he is amazing. There's no outrunning Draco. <laughs> and he used to specialise in running down archers on the opposite side. So, yes, a lot of us got run down by Draco. I think I remember. But whether or not it be leather work, book binding, paper making, we have a lot of fun with a whole range of arts and crafts. That's great. You, sorry, you mentioned that you uh, made a lot of tea tunics. Do you have uh, personas or time periods that you focus on? We do now. Back in the early days, um, I'd say the majority of our day clothes were early period, Saxon, Norman, Dark Ages. And the majority of our feasting clothes were things like little light Italians, the Juliet style, because it's so hot here in Queensland. Um, and we do the majority of our events in quite warm weather. Loose light clothing is pretty much a given. For half of the year, a lot of the ladies are very happy wearing two layers of muslin. Mm. But these days we've expanded. With access to the internet, the research has become amazingly easy. Where previously I would buy a pair of cotton gloves and make an appointment with the chief librarian at the State Library back when it was in William Street. And I would be allowed into the rare book room with a librarian standing behind me I'd be allowed to turn the pages of hand-coloured Victorian costume books. Wow. That and stage costuming books was the majority of our resource other than books on art, which had copies of portraits. Obviously, nowadays, all that stuff is available online at the click of a button. Yep. It's a whole different world. But when, when I talk about our clothes i tell people that we did our first 10 years roughly as dark ages viking sort of garb 
Then we did 10 years as late period nautical, what you might call pirates. And now we've been doing... Feathers in the hat and brocade <laughs> waistcoats. All of the pretty things. You can still see my hat just over there somewhere. Um, and now we've been sort of 15 years as Mongol. She took up mm -hmm. felt making and decided that we might look into Mongolian costume or Mongolian culture. And here we are, 15 years on, still doing Mongol, mostly. But we also do a lot of random pieces. It depends on the event and whether or not the steward has identified a theme. Mm. So one of our classic tournaments at the beginning of the year here, after our Christmas break, is the closest we can get to Valentine's Day. So almost everyone in Queensland has at least one item in their wardrobe that is red and white. And some of us have many items from sideless surcoats, red tunics with white trim on them, etc. Mm -hmm. And of course, the pirates, red and white striped trousers. I remember one year I went dressed entirely in red with my white belt. And my squires <laughs> came all dressed in white with their red belts. And we won the most romantic well, group of a couple because there were two of them. But we, we, there was a prize for the most romantic couple and they gave it to the three of us. That's so cute. <laughs> I love it. I've got, to, and... I've got to say that your the clothes or the guard that you guys wear is always very striking, like um, particularly the, the more recent Mongol stuff, which I guess I've seen a bit more of. Um, it's, I think that you guys introduced that look to me before a lot of the other kind of people have picked it up and it's always been so different um, to what I guess most people do. Did you ever cop any flack or um, criticism for going down that route? One of the things that has dramatically changed in the society over this last 10 years is the expansion from European focus. In the early days of the society, if someone dared to turn up in even something ancient, you know, Roman, Greek, etc., um, that was not so much stared at as wondered about, but the idea of, hey, we can actually document Chinese ambassadors, etc., as well as the Mongols invading. Um, a lot of these things over this last 10 years, and now, of course, this year, with the Board of Directors in California, actually taking the word European out of our mission statement. A lot of this kind of using other cultures has become routine rather than unusual. Mm. And I'm going to say no, we never encountered any resistance. I think any resistance to Mongolian um, culture was way back when the Great Dark Horde formed in the, I don't know, in the AS10s or something. It was way back then and there was a bit of resistance to them, but we've never encountered it, no. It's fair. This question has to come up at some point. Why the Ninja Turtles and why all the green? <laughs> Where does this come from? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll go with the green first because I do get asked that a lot. I think it's actually my eyes are a little bit weak and green is the centre of our visual spectrum. So when I walk into a shop and I look around, the first things I see are green and they're the things that draw my attention. So ever since I was, I don't know, 12 or 13, it's always been green. And that's the only thing I can think of in adult life is I think that's what it's about. Um, the Ninja Turtle, that was uh, Glenn Simon. way back when, early, oh, mid-80s, early, around about the mid-80s, um, the first Ninja Turtle comic came out and I bought a copy, which is probably worth more than my car now. Eastman and Laird did a comic, not expecting to ever do another one, so they didn't put a number on it and they borrowed money from their uncle to actually print it. So the very first Ninja Turtle comic doesn't have a number. There were 
at one stage, 3,000 of them in the world. And I have one. So when I bought that, there was really only the guy I lived with, Richard Delacroix, and myself who knew why the turtles were funny. No one else in Australia would have known. Like they were, nowadays they're a household word, but back then, 3,000 copies worldwide. So um, when I chose it as my uh, totem animal, as my device, no one except Richard knew why it was funny. And that made it even funnier. When it became mega famous, I actually stopped carrying it for probably 10 years because I was embarrassed to be, I don't know, that guy carrying that device. I got over that eventually. Got some great Ninja Turtles stories if you want to hear. A, I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote. No shit, there we were at Penzik War. And I've just been armor inspected. This lady girl runs over. Well, she's younger than me, but you know, she's a lady. Um, runs over and says, excuse me, can I please have a photograph? I love your armor. And I'm wearing, of course, a Ninja Turtle on my Gamerson and on my shield. And I say, sure. I get that. Yeah, I actually get that a lot. People really do want pictures of it because it is kind of out there. And as she's taking the picture, she says, I know the guys who draw this comic. And I said, okay, as long as it won't lead to a cease and desist order, continue. And then two years later, I'm down on the battle line, piking people happily. And she runs over and says, hey, remember me? And I said, of course I remember you. What did they say? Oh, they love it. Seen it everywhere. Seen it, you know, lunchboxes, pillowcases, whatever, everywhere. Never in the SEO, love it. So I feel vindicated. <laughs> and then out of the SCA at a science fiction convention, we actually met Mr. Eastman. We came to a convention in the Gold Coast. And I said, one of the things he was doing is he was drawing turtles. And I said, could you please draw a turtle with a green mask? And he said, sure, what weapon should it have? And I said, gotta have two weapons. Gotta have a sword and a spear. And he said, no problem. And the next morning I had my turtle with a green mask and a sword and a spear. That's so cool. And your Richard, is it up there in the is it up there on the shelf behind that? Oh well. I think it's just over there, but I can't see it from where I'm sitting and I've got a cat on my lap. Well if we if we can get a picture of it at some point, we can certainly share it. Um, 100%. Yeah. Well, it's definitely on his Facebook page. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, we'll see if we can get our, our tech Sleuth Magnus to, to find it. <laughs> I am I, I am curious about you you mentioned about the color green, but you have a, a specific shade of green that you use as well. <laughs> Not really. More by accident than design. <laughs> well, it's actually that particular shade of green, which you know I'm happy to have called agro green by most of the folks in the lockout. It is actually right in, like, you get a green laser pointer. Very bright. <laughs> when, when the green laser pointers, it's roughly that colour. And that colour is 555 angstrom. It's the very centre of our visual spectrum. And that's just the colour that I like. So uh, that's why I put it down to my eyes. <laughs> arts and Sciences story. Oh, she wants the Arts and Sciences story. Again. No shit, there we were. Way back when I was wearing that colour green, I got a lot of flack over that. Never about the Mongolian stuff, but definitely a lot of flack over the green and for a long time. And I had a good hard look at it and said, no, I am certain I can produce this colour green using authentic dyes. It's just that I was in university and the dyes I needed were saffron and indigo. Now, saffron I could get anywhere. Indigo had to come from a chemical supply house. And it was like, I could buy a few ounces of, of, of indigo dye or I could eat for a month. These are my choices. So I don't need to win the bet that badly that I'm going to you know, pay that amount of money to win the bet. Now, 25, 30 years on, we're in Egypt, traveling to Penzik. Because you're going to Penzik, everywhere's either on the way there or on the way home. It's the other side of the world. So we're in Egypt and I'm in a spice market and I can see side by side in ice cream buckets, saffron and indigo. I said, how much is that? It was like 20 cents a pound or something. 
So sure, I need a pound of that, a pound of that. And I got to Penzik and I started dyeing my agro green using authentic dyes and it would not work. I got nothing. So I turned to a nearby Lowell friend and said, do you know anything about dyeing? Because this should be working and it isn't. And she said, I know nothing. But a friend of mine down here in Merchants Row is a Laurel in Diane. So I popped down to her and said, um, hi, can you help me please? And she said, sure, tell me what you're doing. I described it. She said, right, you're doing everything right. I'm going to have to come and have a look. And she arrived and she said, right, I found your problem. That's not saffron. That's not indigo. And I thought, I've been ripped off in an Egyptian spice market. Could it be any more authentic than that? <laughs> So eventually I got um, turmeric on site and woad, which were my best yellow and my best blue, and totally succeeded. And he won the Riverhaven Arts and Sciences competition when we came home with his experiment on a beautiful piece of silk, turning it agro green. And it was eye hurting really green. Well, again, at Penzig, I got, I don't know, 15, 20 different fabric samples and dyed them all to see which one would take the colour best. And if you haven't died with woad, you absolutely should, because it is a magical experience. You pull it out of the dye bar and it That's hasn't right. changed colour. The dye is a kind of a, a urine yellow colour and the fabric has not changed colour. And then as you're holding it and thinking, what have I done wrong? It just starts turning blue as it either dries or oxidises. I'm not sure what the chemical process is, but something chemical is happening. And no wonder they thought it was magic. Wow. That's great. So we've, um, we've managed to find the picture. I'm going to see. Oh, I can't share my screen. Oh, I know. Well, uh, we'll, we'll put it up in the comments on the, on the video so everyone can see it. Sure. <laughs> it's very cool. Very impressed. And so good that you can recreate that, that agro green colour too. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of colours that I think we don't think are period because they're so bright and garish or um, fluorescent even but like a lot of that stuff is there and in history so oh. a lot of it is achievable but it's neither light fast nor is it wash fast so quite a few of the blues that i wear are perfectly capable of being dyed in period there's the picture perfectly yeah. capable of being dyed in period but you have to keep re-dyeing it now, whether or not you're using local products or imported, it's always going to be expensive. Mm. But yes, the bright blues that I wear, um, indigo woad and a range of other chemicals do produce these colours. And working on silk gives you the most amazing luminescence, whether or not it be reds, purples, yellows, the silk really does make a difference. The subtle colours on wool I think make a lot of people think that the colours should be subtle, they should be dull, but the brightness on silk, it's nothing like it. It's really wonderful. I have to say in that, that image. The that's, the, that's the turtle with the ninja, uh, with, with the Mongol helmet. Yeah, that's what I was going to comment on. That, there's a <laughs> Mongol helmet on your I ninja. may have asked for a Mongol helmet as well. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, oh, wow. Thank you. Very um, good. We do have a question from uh, someone in the populace, and they've asked that they would love to hear about your most memorable event and what made it so. How can we choose? 37 <laughs> years. I don't know how many events. Um, you were mentioning to us prior to, to going live about your the length of time that you've spent at Penzik. Well, yeah, let's... Okay, well, sure. Um, Penzik War, which we have been to, I think, 18, we probably have to say that is our most memorable event. I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to say which one. I'll list a few others when you're finished, Neil. Yeah. Um, one of the freakish things about Penzik, I mean, it's there every year. That's the best thing about Penzik is it will be there every year barring the last two but it's two weeks long so we've been to 18 Penzix. that's 36 weeks that's nine months we have spent nine months at Penzik war 
there are folks who have spent over a year at Pens of War. And I thought, yeah, we'll probably get there. So we hope to. We certainly hope to. So, yeah, okay, I'll go with my, my most memorable event is Pens of War, just because it keeps happening and all kinds of great things happen there. Um, Glenn and I have been talking about what's our, what's our best, no shit, there I was story. I can't narrow it down to one. There's just too many over a, you know, I've got nine months at Kendrick, there's 10,000 people there. It's, there's going to be some stories. Um, the one I, I'll give you now, the first Penzik war we went to, and this is why it was memorable, I guess, is we absolutely ruled that year. There were six heavy fighters from Lockout. We signed up with the King of the East who had the smallest numbers. We always take this course with the, the lesser side so that we get a lot of fighting in. And he said, right, um, there's six of you. That's not really enough. We're going to add these six uh, Viking mercenaries to your numbers. So there's at least 12 of you. And we became their immediate friends because the lockout camp is right next to the main battlefield. And their camp is a mile away from the main, the main battlefield. And we had a tent that they could put their gear in. So we were immediately their top guys. But up in the woods battle, there were the 12 of us. And no. Yes. I was beside the banner because we were asked to split up between those who were willing to run and those who were willing to stand. So I stayed with the banner defence team and Agro and the boys, they did the running. You've got me there. That's entirely true. So the 11 of us are in the middle of the, of the wood somewhere. We've got no idea what's going on. I never saw a banner. There were like three banners on each side. I never even saw one. But down on our left, we hear someone saying, we're losing it on the left flank. So we figure, yeah, we're going to help. And we sprint down the hill and there's these two lines of fighters, 100 fighters engaging another 100 fighters. And we slam into the enemy on our end. And, of course, that distracts them all briefly as they look to see what's going on. And literally, a hundred guys step forward and kill the other hundred guys in a split second. And that's all over. We, we, you know, we hold that part of the field now, and somebody shouts, "We're losing it on the right flank!" And so we sprint up the hill, and the exact same thing happens as we hit that. And at the end of the battle, the king of these comes to us and says, "I have never seen anything like that in my whole life. You guys are amazing." That was our first penzik, and I'll give you the last. Battle of the First Penzik War. Gregory of Lock Swan was our nominal commander. We sort of swapped it over among the knights who were there every day. And on this day, the Kingdom of Eldermere and the Kingdom of the West formed up with us as well. So we had about 40, 50. And Greg says, right, on the lay on, this is the, the main field battle. So there's a thousand fighters facing a thousand fighters just across an open field. Gregory says, right, double time. So the 50 of us, double time. Nobody else's. It's important to know that they were at one end of the line. Yeah, we're on the extreme right-hand end of the line. And it's double time, so we double time forward. We get to about halfway, and Greg says, right, slow to a walk. I'm looking around and thinking 50 of us are about to engage a 1,000 of them. There's only one way that can end, and we're not going to win. Yeah, sure, it's, a, you know, it's an SCA battle, so we're not going to die, but we're not going to win. And they form a little pocket, like the enemy forms... They have to thin their line a bit in front of us to form a pocket to engage us who are now 30, 40 metres in front of our main battle line. And as they form their pocket and thin their line, Greg shouts, charge! And we hit their line. We're sort of four deep. They're sort of two deep. We do hit their line and go through it. But I'm not fast, so I'm actually left behind by the charge. And that means that their force that's coming into our flank they get hit by the Kingdom of the West, who is, uh, I'd say, 10 really hard Western fighters, mostly Dukes, all names you'd probably recognise if I told you. Um, and they hit them and they just cut through their bottom third and continued along the enemy line, killing everything in their path. Um, the middle third or so, that got caught by me and a couple of stragglers and we slaughtered them. I was just adrenaline crazed and... I remember that when there was nobody left alive around me, I was running across the field looking for somebody to kill. And I found this guy and said, you, you, I offer you honourable combat. And he said, I'm already dead. 
sort of down dejectedly. And I said, oh, let's just fight anyway. So we fought anyway. It's the younger, faster fighters that left him behind. Yeah. And were just sweeping across the field, killing everything. So, yeah, Cancer 4 made a bit of an impression on me, and we keep going back. Mm. Your best event, dear. I don't know that I can pick one. No, well. Going to the very first local event was exciting and nice. Going to the first festival, it's like, wow, That's there's 100 festival. other people that do this. Going to our first event in New Zealand, that was exotic and wonderful. And the team over there are quite brilliant. Going to our first American event, we decided that we were going to go to the Kingdom of the West, Crown Tawny, before Lockhack separated and became its own kingdom. So that's just on 20 years, I believe, because we're going to be doing the 20th anniversary next year. So we turn up in Southern California and go to a Kingdom West Crown. And that was dramatic. About 600 people there. But the mm. list of fighters, the household groups, the sheer diversity and range of people. Some people there had found out about the society the week before, and some of them had been playing since the first event. And it was quite amazing. We met some people that we'd heard about as icons of the group. Being in administration and being interested in paperwork and such like, one of the people there was Ellis O'Gorn, absolutely wonderful woman. And she casually introduced us to a gentleman she called Fling, Duke Frederick of Holland. Yeah. A bard of the West, a most amazing storyteller, and yes, one of the veterans of the first event of the society. We went and visited Ellis, and during the conversation, we, we were talking about the history of the society and the fact that we like telling stories. And as an offhand comment, Fleet mentioned, oh, you know. Just a, 10 minutes down the road is the um, site of the first event. There's our cat. There's our littlest cat. So we actually, in the middle of the night, drove to this address. Brett snuck his hand underneath the gate of the, um, the driveway and felt around. But it was all concrete. We couldn't find any soil. Because we were going to grab a small handful of soil and bring it home as... You know, soil from the Holy Land. Yeah. So we had to go back in daylight and knock on the door. Fleek had not mentioned that he had actually done that the previous year, one of their major anniversaries. So, Agro, continue, please. So I knock on the door. This 20-something girl answers. I say, this is going to sound totally crazy, but I've come from Australia and... In your backyard 30, 35 years ago, this social club that I belong to started and I just need a little bit of dirt from your backyard as a memento. And she looked over her shoulder and said, Mum, more of those medieval crazy people for dirt from the backyard? Because, yes, Frederick of Holland had been there the year before to collect dirt for one of their anniversaries. But since we're from Australia, we got a guided tour. We got the dirt we wanted. Everyone's happy. Cost me, I can't remember, quite a bit to get Quarantine it back into and the immigration country. were not happy. No, they didn't want to see that dirt. But they radiated the heck out of it. And I was, it, it cut down from its normal size to one-tenth of its current size after they irradiated it a lot. But we got it. They okay. gave it back to us. It cost us a little bit of money. And we put it in little vials. And for the... Um, set up for the kingdom, uh, we presented bowls of dirt from the first event. 
That's great. Do you know if they're still around? That people still have them? Do you have any? Well, we still have ours. I was looking over there. I can't see it. We've got the week after that event that she's talking about, the, the first Crown Tawny that we fought in, um, we went to a war, the West End Tier War, just above California. Eugene, Oregon. And one of the people we met was Diana Listmaker, who's the lady who ran the first SCA event. It was her backyard that we were talking about. And just like a minute before I met her, somebody said, what are the, who are the people you've met? Um, depends who's hosting it, maybe. Um, who are the people you met? And we gave them a list of all the living legends that we had met. And they said, did you collect autographs? And I said, no, nah, autographs are tacky. I would never do that. And <laughs> then they said, I, I, I see you, you haven't mentioned Diana Listmaker. She's right over here. Oh, really? So I grabbed the leaflet that Frederick gave us, which is a leaflet, a, a copy, copy of, of the, the, first, first leaflet. the first leaflet that was used, you know, come to a, a tournament that celebrates the sword, or it is May. And I said, could you please sign this? <laughs> and it was almost in the same breath as I would never collect, you know, autographs. <laughs> could you please sign this? <laughs> and the lady actually asked, do you want me to sign as my analyst maker? Because she is also a science fiction author as well. Well, no, she signed it both ways. She signed Diana Paxton, which is her, her, her yeah, science fiction author name. And I looked at it and she said, oh, you wanted Diana Listmaker, didn't you? And I said, yes, here's another one. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I wanted. <laughs> and we've actually, when we came home, we scanned and actually put that up. And when we started having the internet, we circulated it then because so many people weren't aware of the early history because that's what we specialise in. We specialise in stories. <laughs> history because we were there for a lot of it not real history <laughs> but the history of the society yes. and sometimes we're lucky enough to be able to collect the apocryphal story and the real one <laughs> so the beginning of Penzik and the story of the king who declared war on himself and lost he actually heard it from carrier dock of the bow himself I cornered him in a in an alley one night, I had a bunch of... <laughs> at Penzik. Yeah, at Penzik. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, all all, all the most of the ROS stories happen at Penzik. Thank you um, for but I had a group that. Of, <laughs> had a group of first-timers with me, and I saw him wandering past and said, excuse me, Your Grace, but I have some generals here from Luckack who'd never been to a Penzik war before. Could you please tell us the story of the first Penzik? You know, I can tell them my version, but why would I when I've got you? And so he told the story to a, a group of Luckett folk and it was wonderful, as you would expect. He's told that story a lot. The apocryphal story <laughs> is that the two kingdoms, the east and the middle, were fighting over the debatable lands and whoever lost got Pittsburgh. So that's the story they tell down at the, the tavern. But mm -hmm. That's not the story from Carrier Dog. You're Press one. I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> Karyadoc is a wonderful fighter. He was king of the Middle Kingdom and he wanted a war. So he wrote to his brother in the East and said, let's have a war. But he's a tremendously authentic fellow. He is the uh, creator of the enchanted ground on which nothing mundane is permitted. And he is extremely persona driven. When he told the story, one of our friends offered him a drink and he said, I can only have something that the prophet would not uh, deny me and he looked at me like what has he just said and I said he wants something non-alcoholic he can't have alcohol for his persona is Muslim and yeah so he's, he sends a really well written letter of war declaration wrapped around a broken arrow to the king of the east and he looks at it and says no nah, we don't need war right now tosses it in a drawer never seen again until carrier dot moves from the middle kingdom to the east kingdom with his mundane work and he becomes king because he's still a great fighter. And he turns to his herald and says, I want you to go and find a letter from the mid-realm back in whatever year that was and bring it to me at court. But they bring it to court and he unwraps the, the letter from around the broken arrow and the herald reads it. And it actually names all the great households in the east and pokes fun at them, insults them in some 
uh, appropriate way. And the kingdom is incensed and goes to war. And at the war declaration, the sides are relatively even until the great dark horde stands forward and Yang the nauseating, the leader of the great dark horde stands forward and Hariadok, the king of the east says, it will be great to see the banners of the great dark horde flying beneath those of the east at this war. And Yang says, I'm sorry, Hariadok, but that cannot be. And he says, of course, my friend, I have misspoken. I meant to say it would be wonderful to see the banners of the great dark horde flying with those of the east at this war. And Yang says, I'm sorry, but that can't happen either. And Hariadok says, but Yang, did you not promise to fight with me this war? And Yang says, yes, I did promise that, and I will. But the great dark horde declares for the middle. And so Cariadoc, as the king, loses the battle. The king of the war himself and lost. Yep. <laughs> now it's, it's, it's Pensic 49 that hasn't quite happened these last two years. Yes. So all that happened 51 years ago now. Wow. That's, that's very So cool. yes, it's hard to pick a favourite story. It's hard to pick a favourite event. There's some yeah. amazing things have happened over the decades. Whether or not the event be 20 people, you know, down in a local council park through to, as I said, our first Kingdom West crown. And following on from that, Dan, what has kept you in the society for this long? Mm. Do you want me to take that one? Away? We'll both speak. Sure. Okay. First. Again, we're on our way to Penzik War. This is just a, this is an epiphany for me. Could have happened anywhere. It just happened to be on the way to Penzik War. We write to our friends in New York and say, look, I can't drive the seven hours after getting off the plane. Can someone offer me or offer us a floor to sleep on, please? And one of our friends says, oh, I've got a spare room. Stay with me. So in his spare room, on one wall, he's got a huge number of books and it's all the books all the authors that we read all the books that we read on another wall he's got games and it's all the games that we play out beside his tv there's all the movies that we watch and it finally dawned on me that everybody i know their house is like this they've got those books they've got those games they've got those movies everybody in the whole sca is just a friend i haven't met yet because we have so much in common. And if we didn't have that much in common, we wouldn't be playing the SCA. So I'm still playing because this is a self-selecting group of friends. Everybody here, I've got a whole lot in common with them. And I'm certainly going to keep coming back for that. And my version of the same story is a little bit different. Because, yes, there's always the crazy uncle you don't want to talk to. But the majority of people in the society are going to be a good fit. As far as my social experience, it has been quite amazing to be able to talk to people from different parts of the world about some very esoteric and tiny enthusiasms, like how to make Elizabethan buttons. The very first Penzik, Agro attended pirate class. So these sorts of things, they're amazing opportunities. From my arts and crafts perspective, I'm still learning. Yes, I've been teaching for more years than I've been in the society, but I am still learning, whether or not it be embroidery, sewing, design. Currently, I'm the local herald. And the advent of the internet and the restrictions of, of COVID have made amazing changes in the way we play the game. I could go to a tiny museum in Germany and see what they have on display. During COVID, they've gone into their storerooms. They've pulled out rare documents that are too fragile to show. They have done high definition, zoomable photography of things like heraldic lists from tournaments from the 1400s that literally will never see the light of day. And we can research these and view them in an arena whereby I can sit at my computer and talk to half a dozen heralds 
from around the world. We're looking at the same document and discussing these things. The world has changed in 30 years. The society we joined has changed. And there's still so many more amazing things to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's that's part of the reason that we're that I know I'm still here it is the social aspect it is constantly learning and honestly hearing these stories and this is part of the reason why we we do this um this channel the the crowns between two roses because we want to learn the history we want to hear the stories and share those stories amongst the populace and we're happy to tell stories at the drop of a hat Anywhere, at any time. <laughs> so when um, in theatre in my first frame, I think it was just as we were in the airport waiting to fly over to Canterbury Fair, I think. Um, I think we were in the airport with you guys and you were telling us like all a bunch of history and traditions that, you know, we, we hadn't had a lot of experience by the time of our first frame. So there's a lot we didn't know. Um, and so you guys certainly helped fill in a few gaps for us. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to know, what are some of your favourite Lockhart traditions? Favourite traditions? So many of the things that we do, I don't know if you'd call them traditions. Or would you say? I'm lost actually. I'm thinking, what is my favourite tradition, or you know, what, what do I consider tradition as opposed to? Well, just just some of the Lockhart cultural things that you like. Like, it doesn't have to be a, a tradition, but something that's, I guess, unique or like Lockharty. <laughs> unique and Lockhart. That's one of the things that we were amazed by in our first trips is the diversity and different customs and behaviours across the kingdoms in the known world. Every group has its own flavour, not just kingdoms. And whether or not it be Canterbury Fair in Southern Guard, whether or not it be um, midnight conversations aboard a war, whether or not it be the, the joy of fighting at Spring War, the classes at Roanee Festival, the atmosphere and bonfires at Great Northern War. There are just so many individual activities and joyful encounters. In the early days of the society here, when we were a Crown Principality, we were actually given a document by the Kingdom of the West to read out at every um, tournament to select the um, Viceroy and Viceroy. And they thought we'd get very tired of this and go principality so much quick, more quickly because of it. But things like reading of scrolls, talking about the history, actually reflecting and respecting the people that have come before us and how they have contributed to the group. As I said, I don't know what you would call some of these activities, whether or not they are traditions. Some of our awards are very reflective of our local attitudes, whether or not they be the courtesy awards, the fighting awards, shining helm for the prettiest fighter, there are so many things that we do which give us flavour and enhance the fame of, fame of the game. Well, the Rowan. We owe uh -huh. so much to Rowan Peregrine. I presume mm. you've spoken to her, but um, we owe so much to her. When you're talking about the traditions of Lockac and how we're different to other places, it's actually due to her influence. She, in the early days inspired us to be as authentic as we possibly could be. Um, one of the things that we talk about is she basically, we got the, the known world handbook and people thought that was a rule book. That was how it should be done. We thought that was the minimum. 
Indeed, that was the it minimum was that could be done. a decade later that we found out that the Americans had written it as aspirational. That's what they would like to see. And we thought that was the minimum. So, yeah, Rowan um, inspired us all to be far better than we might have been. Mm. So there's, a, as she says, the awards talk about our history. Um, I have thought that my favourite Lock Act specific thing is the lineage of the crowns. And they name all the... I'll go to... Hard for me to... He's choking up. I'm a little emotional about this. When they name all the crowds and they give the words that they, that they attribute to those crowds. Beautiful. The poetry is wonderful. We are a very lucky group. We are a very young group. And we are very lucky that we have lost so few people who have been essential to our history so far. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, it, it's actually been a, an amazing interview and such an awesome catch up in, and getting to hear your stories and your thoughts and ideas around the SCA. I know for me, um, you guys were, uh, you were both some of the first people I met in the SCA. Riverhaven is my, my home group. And uh, my first event in Riverhaven was a 10 year anniversary. So yeah, and and when I when I went there, it was you need to talk to Agra and Glenavar. <laughs> they will just tell you all of these stories. <laughs> and we're still doing it. Yeah. I think I think we need our own Agra and Glenavar show just to. to, to <laughs> <laughs> well, Glenn, when, when you invited us, Glenn said, "How are we going to talk for an hour?" And, and I said. You're married to me. How are they going to stop me from talking <laughs> for an hour? It's <laughs> and it's our passion. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that. Happy to do so. I think we could we could certainly go on for a, a lot longer, but we have hit our, our one hour. Is there anything you wanted to, to talk about before a final? <coughs> No you, got your best, there I was story. you got your best no shit there I was story, dear. Okay. The first Penzik we went to, I walked into the merchant's row and saw a tent with armour. <laughs> I walked into this pavilion and it had wooden shelves around the three walls. There were more complete helmets in a variety of designs available for sale than I had seen in one place in Australia ever. And it was just mind-blowing to see the scale, the sheer volume of material that their numbers could support. And yes, I did three photographs around that pavilion and that was one of my pride of place photograph sets when we came home. You could walk into a single tent and this was not the only armor at Penzik. No. <laughs> you could walk into a single tent and pick one of 150 helmets and pay some money and walk away. And of course in Lockac at that time and probably even now, you want a helmet. It's like, you know, could you please make me a helmet? How long will it take? And if you're lucky enough to get into the queue in who knows how many months you'll have your helmet. Um, it was incomprehensible. There were so many helmets just available to buy and walk away with. And different sizes, different styles. It was a wonderland. Right. My, no, my best no shit there I was story. Impossible. Um, I will give you... The first no shit there I was story ever told in Lockac. I didn't tell it, I heard it. But um, the Kingdom Archer, William of Briardust, Kingdom of the West, had come out to Rowanee Festival with a handful of other knights and the king. And very late one night in the tavern, he was telling a story. And Elfin of Mona, who was prince, he said, No, no, stop, stop. 
I need you to tell me the story again, but start with no shit, there I was. And I'm assuming that that's a known thing elsewhere in the world, that Elfin had travelled and heard stories being told that way. If not, Elfin actually invented the no shit, there I was story, but William O'Brien, asked as quick as a spark, turned to Elfin and said, right, no shit, there I was. And he was Prince of the Mists, and he was at Penzik War because all no shit there. Are. And he was at no. Penzik War. And after a hard day in the field, the Royal Guard of the Mists were carrying him back to the shower and they were carrying him shoulder high on a shield. So there's four or six guys holding a shield. He's crouched on the shield somehow, holding on for dear life. He says he was terrified they were going to drop him because where they were traveling, it was all muddy and horrible. And they get to this point in the road where there's somebody standing in their way. One of his bannermen shouts, make way for the Prince of the Mists. And the person doesn't make way. They turn around to say something and they, they, they're not stopping. They just trample this guy into the ground. And he looks down and he says, double time you idiots, that's the King of the East. <laughs> and that was the first no shit there I was story ever told in Locker. And it's a beauty. So I tell it to you now. <laughs> So good. Oh, that is awesome. Well, thank you again so much. It has been awesome to have you both on here. Um, and I've I've had an awesome, I've had a great time. Thank you. You too. Well, thank you for having us, and we're happy to share our many, many wonderful years. That's so cool. Awesome. Well um I think uh, next week's Crown Tawny, so we're, we're skipping our, our usual, epi usual episode and uh, setting up some streaming for Crown, so that's happening next week with us. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining us tonight and hope everyone's well and enjoying the springtime that has come along. So thanks we're again. We're actually missing a demo up at Landsborough to talk to you this evening. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us and, and sharing your stories and experiences. It's been absolutely wonderful. Yes. So yeah, we'll see we'll see everyone next week and um she'll be very exciting. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we will see you online. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.